Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this is going to be, I think, it's just a, a, such a fabulous, fabulous program. And um, the Western Lieutenancy is very honored to have uh, the author, Stephen Rasha, join us this evening. Um, we do have some guests from outside of the Western Lieutenancy also. So just allow me to introduce myself. I am Dame Margaret Romano, and I am the Lieutenant for the Western Lieutenancy. Um, before we do hear from our speakers, would you please join me in prayer this evening as we place ourselves in communion with God, our Father, and His Son, and with the prayer of the Western Lieutenancy, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, Almighty God, we the knights and dames of the Holy Sepulchre, who throughout the centuries have watched and witnessed at the gloriously empty tomb of Jesus, beg you to send us forth again under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, clad in the armor of our faith with good works as our sword in the loving service of Christ our King. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. Well, we are gathered here tonight to hear from author Stephen Rasha, author of the book, The Disappearing People, The Tragic Fate of the Christians in the, in the Middle East. We also have with us tonight as our moderator, Sir Nick Whitner. Now, Nick is going to tell you about Stephen, give you his bio, but before I turn the program over to him, I'd like to tell you about Nick. Nick asked me that I keep my comments about him brief, and in all honesty, I could take an entire hour just giving Nick's bio and Stephen's bio, so I will be brief. <laughs> a member of the order since 2002, Nick is a law professor dedicated to human rights. He and Dame Cynthia, his wife, are the Justice and Peace Coordinators for the Orange County area. Nick also serves as the Western Lieutenancy Liaison to the Catholic Center for Human Rights based in Jerusalem. We know it as the Society of St. Eves. It was created by the Latin Patriarch to protect the rights of the church and human rights of Palestinian Christians. It has been a ministry, as you know, of the Western Lieutenancy for many years, receiving our support. The Western Lieutenancy is very fortunate to have the dedication of Sir Nick and Dame Cindy through the years. They are truly examples of the wonderful members of Holy Sepulchre. I hope you find this next hour to be an informative look at the situation in the Holy Land. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and I turn the program over now to Sir Nick Whitner. Thank you. Thank you, Margie, for that overly generous introduction. Um, and especially for all of your help to make tonight's program so special and possible for us. So we welcome the dames and knights of our order and guests to this very special presentation the disappearing people, the tragic fate of Christians in the Middle East. This is, as Margie said, an extraordinary event, which is coming live from the Archdiocese of Erbil in Iraq. It's where Pope Francis made his historic journey to stand above the destruction wrought by ISIS and to celebrate mass for 10,000 Christians. Our speaker for this evening's program is Stephen Rasha, an American human rights lawyer recognized by the United Nations, the European Union, and the United States Congress as an expert on the persecution and genocide against Christians in the Holy Land. 
Steve worked in Erbil and has been, that's where he is tonight, since 2010, serving as counsel to Archbishop Bashar Warda of the Archdiocese of Erbil. Archbishop Warda, assisted by Steve, led a humanitarian relief effort for over 100,000 Christians who, in a matter of days, had fled to Erbil ahead of the ISIS onslaught. Steve lived and worked with the persecuted Christians in their communities, including for the entirety of the war against ISIS. As the Archbishop, at the Archbishop's request, Steve authored a book documenting the acts of genocide um, committed against the Christians in the Middle East and especially in Iraq. Many have sought refuge in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. Steve's work was instrumental in the United States' decision to issue a declaration of genocide against Middle East Christians. Our program, which shares the same name as Steve's book, includes an introduction by Archbishop Wara, an interview with Steve, the unveiling of parts of a soon to be released documentary that depicts tragic events, but also the message of hope in Pope Francis's visit. The program will conclude with a blessing by the Archbishop and a recitation of the Our Father in Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke and which is still the language of the Christians remaining in Iraq. I am now privileged to welcome Steve, and it's truly an honor. Hello, Steve. Good evening. May I ask you to introduce the message from the Archbishop, please? Sure. And, and before before I do, Nick, I, I'd like to thank yourself and, and all of the Knights for making this, uh, this presentation possible. Uh, we're tremendously grateful for all your time and care and, and sharing uh, and helping to share our story uh, with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Archbishop Bashar Warda. I first met the Bishop in uh, 2010, just after he'd been installed as the uh, Archbishop of Erbil. And I've been working with him in various capacities uh, ever since. Prior to becoming the Archbishop, uh, uh, Archbishop Bashar was the rector at the Peter and Paul Seminary here in Erbil. And before that, he was a parish priest in Baghdad and survived uh, numerous attacks on, on his church in the chaos that followed 2003. Uh, Archbishop Bashar describes himself as, as a builder, and uh, throughout the time of the crisis, uh, he continued to build uh, in the face of uh, real difficulty. Uh, he's a founder of the Catholic University in Erbil. He's the uh, founder of the Mariamana Hospital, uh, as well as numerous other schools, and continued to build new churches uh, while, uh, while the war was going on. Uh, most importantly, he's become perhaps the leading international figure uh, and vo voice for his people, the Christians uh, of Iraq, uh, testified in front of the UN uh, and, and numerous other places. And uh, you'll see some of that in the video coming up. So it's my pleasure to introduce Archbishop Bashar Warda. Good evening and greetings to you all from the Christians of Iraq. I am Archbishop Bashar Warda, and I am the Chaldean Catholic Archbishop of Erbil in Kurdistan, northern of Iraq. I am most grateful to have this time to share our story with you. I pray that this will be the beginning of a time of a dialogue and solidarity between us all. Here in Iraq, our ancestors were among the very first people to receive the gospel from the original apostles. 
in the first century after the birth of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our daily common language and our liturgy itself is still celebrated in Aramaic, the language of Christ. We believe that despite all our hardship and suffering, that we still have an important role here in our homeland and that our presence has continued meaning for Iraq and for the world. I hope that this presentation today will help you to understand this as well. God bless you all and I will see you again at the end of the program. So, Steve, I think it would be helpful actually to orient our members to the geography, especially the Nineveh Plains, Mosul, Erbil, the centers for Christian life before the ISIS genocide. Could you please, using the maps uh, that you sent to us, uh, begin at the 30,000 foot level and then take it all the way down to what's on the ground today? Sure. The uh, map you see in front of you uh, it shows the, the city of Erbil up at the top. And most of the, the uh, uh, events that we're describing take place in that northern section of Iraq, uh, Erbil and the area to the west. If you look at this map, you see Erbil and then to the west of Erbil, Mosul. And ISIS uh, first uh, uh, took control of Mosul early in the summer of 2014 and then moved across towards Erbil to the east, uh, across much of the area that is known of, uh, as the Nineveh Plain, which is a historically Christian area of northern Iraq. And if you look at this map here, uh, kind of just about the middle of it, you can see again, Erbil, it's uh, spelled I-R-B-I-L on this map, and you see Mosul there. And uh, again, most of this uh, activity that we'll discuss uh, takes place in that area between Erbil and Mosul and areas just to the north and just to the south of Mosul. You get an idea of, of kind of, uh, of how close all of this was. The, the driving distance between Mosul and Erbil, uh, if there were uh, just a clean road without checkpoints or difficulties of any, any kind, is just about an hour. Uh, it's, it's quite close. It's about, uh, I think, 64 uh, miles or so. And uh, for much of the war, uh, the, the, uh, the front line between ISIS and the coalition forces was uh, at a midpoint there between uh, Mosul and Erbil. You can see further down south at the bottom of this map is Baghdad. And at the height of the uh, ISIS uh, power, they were uh, in control of nearly all of Western Iraq with fingers wrapping around uh, Baghdad and up into uh, the area just around Erbil and down into Kirkuk. Okay. May we have the video, please? And Steve, before we actually play the video, would you kindly comment on what we're about to see and hear? Sure, sure. So what you're about to see is uh, when Pope Francis came uh, for his visit uh, to Iraq in March, uh, the Archdiocese decided we would begin filming uh, with the intention of creating a documentary film, a full-length documentary film based around the visit of uh, Pope Francis, but also filling in uh, much of the other things that had uh, occurred and, and were, were affecting the Christian population uh, in Iraq. The, uh, the uh, short video that you're about to see, it's about 14 minutes, uh, consists 
consists of various clips that uh, we've put together and, and uh, tried to make into a, a coherent short film uh, for you. Um, this that uh, should help uh, for today, today's uh, presentation and for you to understand uh, the recent history as well as visually to see what's, uh, what's taken place there. Uh, a, a quick note, on the uh, on the audio of it, you'll hear three different hymns uh, that are sung uh, during the course of, of the video. Uh, the first of these is a uh, lament, uh, and, and this is uh, sung by uh, uh, a priest, uh, Father Salar of uh, Al Kosh in, in Tilaskov. Uh, the second of these is a hallelujah sung by Father Savio, um, and uh, that's uh, you'll be able to recognize it, I think, as, as a hallelujah. And uh, uh, the third is a song, uh, a hymn to Mary, and this is in the closing clip uh, that you'll see the faces of the people. But all of this singing uh, is in Aramaic. Uh, the tonalities are uh, from the Eastern uh, tones, so somewhat different uh, for you, but they're all hymns and uh, for the most part, uh, ancient hymns, uh, quite old. In the spring of 2014, the ancient Christian towns of Nineveh in northern Iraq lay quietly waiting, praying against the storm of terror gathering to the west. Would it come to them? Later that summer, it came. Rolling over everything in their path, ISIS took Mosul, then rampaged through the Nineveh plain in the north and stormed across the desert and towards Baghdad in the south. When the terror of ISIS blasted through Nineveh in early August, every Christian town emptied and fled. In the course of three days, more than 100,000 homeless Christians dragged themselves into the Kurdish capital of Erbil, looking for shelter in the Christian enclave of Ankawa. ISIS had been stopped less than an hour's drive outside the city, and no one knew what the future would hold. <laughs> Oh, 
2016, the coalition offensive to take back Nineveh had begun. For the displaced, they had lived for the past two years in the hope they might someday return to their homes, not knowing what they would find. But a devastating reality waited for them. In January 2017, Chaldean Patriarch Louis Sacco led a return delegation to the once Christian town of Telkev, which until only days before had been a major ISIS stronghold. Words of hope for a Christian return were quietly shared in a spare gathering, but under a heavy guard the somber delegation soon left. Meanwhile, in town after town, the first returns continued to find little but despair. For some of the Christians of Nineveh, the shock of what they found in their devastated towns pushed them to a final decision, and they silently packed up their few belongings that remained and left Iraq for good, joining the growing diasporas in Turkey Lebanon, Jordan, and beyond. Despite the darkness of the winter before, as the warmth and green of spring returned, hope for many returned as well. Determined still to recover the towns and lands where their people had lived since before the time of Christ, they began to return and rebuild with what meager means they could find. By Holy Week of 2017, processions moved slowly through burned out towns, surrounded by armed soldiers, but the people themselves sang hallelujahs. By the fall of 2019, with ISIS now vanquished throughout the country, Iraq nevertheless appeared on the verge of complete collapse. Disaffected Iraqi youths by the hundreds of thousands took to the streets day after day, demanding the end to the sectarian government system that had been crushing them for more than a decade. Understanding the reality of the threat to their rule, thinly disguised armed gangs fronting for the ruling factions took reprisals, and the murder and intimidation of unarmed protesters climbed daily. In early December, as the crisis deepened, 
Archbishop Bashar Warda spoke as a witness at a full meeting of the UN Security Council in New York. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Goodwill. Thank you, Madam President, and all of you gathered here. The current protests in Iraq demonstrate the rejection by the majority of the Iraqi people of the post-2003 structure and government of the country. It is a rejection of a sectarian-based constitution which has divided Iraq and prevented it from becoming a unified and functioning country. And instead of bringing hope and prosperity, the current government structure has brought continued corruption and despair, especially to the youth of Iraq. Meanwhile, in Baghdad, Patriarch Louis Sacco led a delegation of Iraqi bishops on foot to Tahrir Square, and it seemed for a brief moment that perhaps real change might be at hand. But as full winter arrived, and with it the COVID pandemic, the protest movement faded, and with it, hopes for most Iraqis. By 2021, the Iraqi Christians were increasingly resigned that their moment of hope may have permanently passed them by. The world's gaze had looked upon them briefly, then moved on to other disasters and other fights. But in Rome, a stubborn and courageous 84-year-old Argentinian Jesuit had other ideas. Pope Francis has just landed in Iraq, where he's going to fulfill a long-standing promise to become the first pontiff to visit the country. في زيارة تاريخية وصل باب الفاتيكان فرانسيس إلى العراق زيارة هي الأولى من نوعها لباب الكنيسة الكاثوليكية. Il viaggio in Iraq di Papa Francesco dal 5 all'8 marzo su invito della Repubblica di questo grande paese. Arriving in Erbil for the open air mass at the end of a punishing two day schedule in the face of rocket attacks, pandemic, and the counsel of many close to him, Pope Francis made good on his promise to be with his people. And as the Pope Mobile made its way round the soccer stadium turned into a church, the reality of his presence was clear to all. Francis had come to his people in Iraq, and with him came the eyes of the world. Physically exhausted, but spiritually a rock, Papa Francesco was with them now, and for this, they would love uh -huh. him forever. And so, what comes now for those Christians of Iraq that remain? Will their neighbors and the larger world see them as human beings? deserving of dignity and respect, worthy of a continued place in their ancient lands? Or will it cast them aside once again, continued collateral damage in a fractured world that moves from distraction to destruction? Whatever future awaits the Iraqi Christians, they are clearly themselves apostles now. And the 2,000-year-old letter of St. Paul to the Romans 
speaks to them directly. For we know that affliction perfects patience in us and patience experience and experience hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has come in. Steve, that is a that is a wrenching video. Um, and now I understand why you did what you did, working with Archbishop Warda. Um, and. I do want to ask you about that because our members ought to know um, I'm sorry. So Steve, you worked with one of the nation's most prestigious law firms. You were a commercial, your transactional lawyer. And as I understand it, you went to Erbil to conclude some commercial matters. And then after returning, you got an, on an airplane in Boston, flew to Frankfurt, and from there to Erbil. And you've been working on and off there since 2010. I was going to ask you why. And now I see why. Would you tell us what impelled you to return and devote 11 years and live in a war zone for three years. Sure, sure. So, um, well, thank you again, uh, Nick. And uh, I hope the, the, the video uh, gave people, a, 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 you know, a, at least a, a general feeling uh, for what the situation is there on the ground. It looks like we had a, a, a little technical difficulty in, in some of the, the clips from the mass itself uh, itself. Um, but, uh, uh, but the, um, in, in any case, uh, the, uh, um, my decision to come and, and work here, as you, as you mentioned, I'd been a transactions lawyer doing international transactions, international joint ventures for some years, um, actually first came here, uh, to Iraq in 2006 um, and managed uh, some uh, infrastructure projects, put them together. And as I said earlier, met the Archbishop in 2010 uh, when he became Archbishop of Erbil. And we struck up a friendship. Uh, I began helping him on a pro bono basis with various feasibility studies and whatnot. And uh, in uh, late 2012, uh, I had a, a personal setback myself. I had an open heart surgery. I had an aortic valve replacement and basically spent most of the next year uh, recovering from that in, in one way or another. Uh, but by 2014, uh, I was ready to uh, uh, come and, and start, uh, start up some of my work uh, abroad again, including work in uh, Iraq and had already had intentions to come uh, that summer when uh, the ISIS threat uh, began building. 
Um, and then when it actually came in, uh, in 2000, late 2014, late summer of 2014, uh, the archbishop uh, and others there uh, got in touch with me and said, look, the situation's really, really desperate here. Um, can you come uh, and see what you can do to, to help us out? We're just overwhelmed. And so uh, in the fall of that, uh, that year, um, I came and uh, uh, talked with the archbishop and, and saw uh, really what the need was. Uh, he asked me at that point um, uh, if I would stay. Um, and that meant essentially giving up my private practice and, and coming to work uh, full time for the church, um, which had no money. Um, it was one of the big uh, the issues they were facing. Um, and he, uh, but he asked if I would uh, come and help them in this, in this time. And uh, so I went through uh, a, a short discernment on that and it basically came down to the view of, uh, and I'd been thinking on this during the whole time of my recovery as well in the prior year, it really uh, got me to thinking about uh, uh, what was my faith? What did I really believe as, as a Christian, as a Catholic Christian? What did I really believe? And uh, uh, I really centered uh, around uh, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, some of the other fundamental teachings of Christ, and then went through a period where I, I asked myself uh, very directly, do you believe this? And if you do, um, what do you need to, to follow? What do you need to do about it? So all these things kind of came together at the same time, my discernment on whether or not I should uh, uh, stay with the archbishop and continue the work there um, was, was relatively brief. It was pretty clear to me um, at that time that, uh, that that was my, my place. And I've not regretted it since. It took me a little bit of time to roll up my, uh, my private practice. Um, and that involved uh, some difficulties, but uh, I, I've not regretted uh, a minute since. So uh, uh, in these last years since then, I've gone back and forth uh, between Iraq and uh, Air, Air Beel, excuse me, Iraq and the U.S. Um, but uh, during the years of the war, I was there pretty much nine, ten months uh, of the year, and uh, continue working there today. Steve, I really applaud you for your courage, and I admire you for your commitment to our faith. Um, it's, it's really a mission and a vocation for you. Yes, you know, yeah, you know, a thing I would say, Nick, is one of the things that I realized, um, it's become abundantly clear to me, is that our faith, our church, the Catholic Church, once you put it to use, once you take advantage uh, fully of everything that our faith, everything that our church has to offer as a universal church, the, the power to really affect change is, is really far more uh, than, than we think. I think this is maybe especially so in the West, you know, in these last years, we've been caught up in, in so many arguments um, and, 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 and disputes. And here in the East, when, when they look at those things, they look at us in the West, they say, well, boy, these are really rich people with a lot of time on their hands. Um, the faith itself and the, the substantive work um, for us um, is, is, is really, uh, uh, really uh, just right in front of us and uh, in need of some real attention and care. So maybe, you know, in that respect, there's, there's things that we can learn uh, from the situation here in the East. I'd like to come back in a little while to the role of 
the church universal as well as the laity. Uh, at, at this point, um, could you share with us the magnitude of the persecution and genocide? Sure. So, you know, the, the, the easiest way to look at this is just in, in, in raw numbers. Uh, prior to 2003, uh, there were uh, somewhere around one and a half million Christians um, in Iraq. And today there are, by most counts, uh, somewhere less than 200,000. Um, and that's uh, just uh, the re direct result of uh, a, a nonstop period uh, of just continually grinding down uh, in terms of daily persecution, uh, interspersed with, with extreme periods uh, of violence um, and attacks and, uh, and just the utter marginalization of the ability to, of the Christians to live their lives. Now, in the last couple of years, uh, since the, uh, the military defeat of ISIS, things have somewhat stabilized. But the question remains uh, whether or not with the small group of people that are still left, the small group of Christians that are still left, uh, whether or not that's a critical mass from which a rebirth can uh, uh, can begin, or whether these are simply the final caretakers, uh, the last people to turn the lights out uh, on the way out. And I think that is clearly uh, still in play, um, and we'll see what comes in these next years. Well, you mentioned the diaspora, and also, and by that, I understand you to mean the refugees who have gone overseas and begun a new life with no intention of ever returning. Well, yeah, so the diaspora itself, actually, there's, there's, there's a, a number of different groups uh, within that. There's an established diaspora community for Iraqi Christians in the U.S. Uh, there are more Iraqi Christians in the U.S. than there are in Iraq. Um, in Detroit, in San Diego, some other places, there are, are, are vibrant, thriving, growing Iraqi Christian communities still celebrating uh, more or less their, their traditional uh, masses. Um, there's another diaspora community which is made up of the refugees who are in a holding pattern. And these would be Iraqi refugees who are primarily now in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, uh, looking for uh, uh, an exit visa uh, to, uh, to a new life somewhere else, uh, primarily uh, Australia, Europe, uh, or the U.S. and Canada. But uh, there's a significant population right now. We don't have exact numbers, but there's a significant population in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and the these people are uh, really in a difficult situation. Uh, they're only there on uh, temporary uh, visas. Uh, they're not permitted to work um, and uh, they're not intending or being offered uh, citizenship or a path to citizenship uh, presently in those countries. Uh, the host countries are holding on to them uh, just as refugees. And uh, uh, their plight is really off the radar screen of, uh, of most people. Certainly, uh, it is not a priority that, that we're aware of uh, for the U.S. State Department um, or anybody uh, in the European Union, uh, for the most part. And so this is one of the issues that we're, we're grappling with, what to do with these people. Uh, there's uh, some hope that they might uh, see improvements in Iraq that would allow them to return, but, but that's, that's unlikely. These people, for the most part, have given up everything to take this step uh, onto a new life somewhere, and, and it's pretty unlikely that, uh, that they'll be coming back, although we do have hopes. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps the visit of uh, Pope Francis uh, is a shot in the arm for that. But those people are, 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 are people that are really stuck and uh, um, really in need of help. So those are really the two diaspora communities that we have. Tell us about the IDPs, the internally displaced persons. 
So the the the, uh, the the greater world, I think, would be surprised to understand that there's actually a real distinction between people who have lost their homes in their towns and are still living in their country versus people who have lost lost their to- their their towns and their homes and had to move across a border and that you're treated differently. But uh, a refugee is somebody who's been forced out of their country and an IDP is an internally displaced person, somebody who's been forced out of their homeland but is still within the borders of their country. Um, At the outset of the ISIS uh, uh, invasion, um, there were uh, well over 100,000 internally displaced Christians, uh, and there were many, many displaced uh, Yazidis and Muslims as well. There were uh, millions of displaced uh, Iraqis. Um, but uh, in the small Christian population, it was really, really heavily felt. Um, and when those displaced Christians, uh, most of them came to the Archdiocese of Erbil. It was the closest place they could come. It was at that time uh, on the Kurdish side, the, the, the Kurdistan region side of safety, at least temporarily. And so they came there to the church and at that time, you know, the ISIS moved so quickly that the institutional aid uh, organizations uh, weren't really prepared for it. And for the Christians, there was really no other place for them to go uh, other than the church and the, uh, the archdiocese and the uh, uh, community there took them in and essentially overnight became a major humanitarian aid provider and had to learn all of this on the fly. And that that was one of the primary reasons that the uh, Archbishop had me come in so we could help put some structure to, you know, how do we uh, uh, work with the various donors? How do we work with the governments? Um, how do we bring some structure to all these people we have to take care of? Um, at, at one point, uh, the Archdiocese of Erbil managed uh, 26 separate uh, displaced person camps all on their own. Their only funding came from private donors um, within, basically within the world of the church and primarily the, uh, the Catholic church. So within as I understand it, just a few days, you had over 100,000 people at your doorstep. Yeah, yeah. And and keep in mind, this is a, this is while Erbil was an archdiocese, um, by by Western standards, it was was quite small. Um, they had a permanent population of uh, somewhere around thirty to forty thousand people, and uh, you know a, a, a small staff of priests and, and sisters and dedicated lay people, but nothing like uh, the size. Uh, the, of, of staff, uh, pastoral and lay staff that we would, uh, that we would, would uh, think of in the West. Um, really, the, the working priests were uh, probably about, uh, at that time, probably about 30 or so um, within uh, Erbil um, at, the, at the most. And uh, they were overnight responsible for, uh, for more than 100,000 people. Oh. The, some of the pictures you saw in, in, in one of the clips running, the, those were the in, interior of the of the, the main cathedral and and the, the courtyards uh, of the churches. And that's where people were living. And you said 26 camps. How did you set up 26 camps with such stretched resources? Yeah, well, we had the, the help uh, of a, a tremendous group of lay volunteers. Um, we struck a deal with the, the Kurdistan regional government that they would provide us with the land and we would and uh, uh, overall security for coming in and out of the camps. Um, and we would take care of everything else. And that was kind of the, the quid pro quo. We said, look, we will dip in uh, to, the, to our global church and put out an SOS, and we will manage that. But the quid pro quo is you let us take care of our people in our own way. Um, and, uh, and 
it worked uh, really uh, quite well. By the time um, it, it came for us to to wrap things up, and thankfully, you know, uh, thanks be to God, let the people move begin to move back home. It was uh, acknowledged uh, pretty much by everybody um, that the uh, the camps that we had run uh, were uh, far surpassed the, uh, the standards. Um, of the other camps that were out there that were run by the established uh, international aid. And, and we were able to do that because we cared for them as the church, you know, not, uh, not as a career, not as uh, you, you know, some sort of long-term uh, venture, but because we, we did it from a place of, of mission and concern for them as people. And, and that made all the difference. You said the refugees returned um, from the camps returned where? Well, this is a, this is a process. I, as you saw in the video, when it was time for them to return, they came back uh, not knowing what they would fi find. And in many of these cases, their towns were destroyed. And then they went through a period of, all right, do we be, do we, uh, uh, involve ourselves in part of the rebuild in our destroyed towns? Do we leave the country completely and just say it's enough? Uh, or do we uh, stay in another place um, in our general area or maybe stay in Erbil and uh, remain part of the rebuild there? So it's a mix of all three things. Some of those towns we've, we've are essentially lost to the Christians, they were not able to be rebuilt and re-inhabited in, in timely enough fashion. And uh, other forces have moved in. Uh, much of Nineveh is still controlled by uh, militia units and the, they're disputed areas. And it's been really, really difficult to rebuild. And some of them, uh, you know, there are checkpoints between towns and from one week to the next, those checkpoints are manned by different people with different, uh, different uh, um, methods of enforcement. It's really uh, quite difficult. On the other hand, some of the towns uh, we were able to recover. Um, two uh, really uh, uh, standout uh, successes for us. Uh, one came from a, a direct grant from the uh, Hungarian government, uh, who was uh, alone amongst the Europeans, who was willing to deal with the church directly. And I know, you know, Hungary's a lightning rod for all sorts of things there in Europe, and they didn't want to get into that. But what, what I can say is that in our experience, they were willing to engage in a model wherein they dealt directly with the church, recognizing the, the central role of the church in these communities. And we did that in the town of, uh, uh, of uh, Teleskov, and uh, that program saved that town in 60 days um, and put to shame all of the other hemming and hawing and process-driven programs that were being put in place uh, by other supposedly professional groups um, that were working in towns that are now lost to the Christians. The other uh, notable example is the town of uh, Karamnes, um, out uh, towards Mosul. Uh, in that case, a, a, a grant from the Knights of Columbus, a $2 million grant at a critical time, right at the beginning of the return. Again, it was a grant to directly to the church, uh, allowing the church the discretion to build the buildings that it needed to have done at the time they needed to have done, um, fix the homes that could be fixed, uh, empower the people themselves directly. Um, and uh, again, another town that was saved within 60 days. Um, and, and that program could have been replicated throughout the region um, for far less money than was eventually spent by the US government, by the European government, uh, by the UN uh, for, a, for a fraction of what they spent. Um, these towns could have been saved uh, for their, their rightful inhabitants um, if they'd uh, used this model, but it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit their paradigm, and there's some some real discussion about that in the book. Yeah. So, 
when they return and rebuild. Um, what, how, uh, what employment do they have? How do they sustain themselves? Yeah, so em employment, employment is a real issue. It's, it's, at this point, it's probably the primary issue because what we found is that people themselves, you know, the Iraqis have been through so much and they're willing to put up with an awful lot um, still if they can have uh, some employment, some dignity, uh, some ability to take care of themselves. Um, it's somewhat ameliorated by the fact that in Iraq, uh, the government is the primary employer, um, and so these salaries have continued to come in fits and starts that have have, have subsidized things uh, in a bit. But but that's really one of the primary things we're we're facing right now, and one of the reasons, uh, at least in uh, Erbil, the Archbishop has focused on developing uh, anchor institutions, so a university, uh, a legitimate uh, Western uh, caliber hospital. Um, and, and other things like that, because we need these anchor institutions uh, for employment. Out in Nineveh, uh, much of those towns, uh, much of the employment out in those towns was historically uh, based in uh, agriculture. And so we're trying to do what we can uh, out there, but it, it remains a serious issue. Uh, so let us turn now from tragic to hope, sure. and in particular, Pope Francis's visit. With, yeah. And I, th I think the clip that you showed us really captures the emotion of that. It, yeah. I, I, I would say that it, it was like a ray of light for your people. Tell us, yeah, a, it, tell it, us more about it, would you? Yeah, it really was. I, I don't know. Maybe it was it was my computer, but it, it seemed that when they showed when we had the the, the Francis moving across in the boat mobile, it, it was it was stuttering um, in, in the film itself. Um, he moves he moves smoothly across and you can really see um, there's a, a huge up, you just uh, upwelling of joy from the people that are running across the field, chasing the mobile is really something. And, and you know, um, you know, Pope Francis, you know, there, there's kind of this Pope Francis as viewed now from the east and Pope Francis as viewed from the west. And and, you know, Pope Francis, um, I think, you know, for, for some of the Roman Catholics, from the Western Catholics, um, has been at times um, uh, difficult to, to, to completely follow in, in, in what, uh, what the direction is that uh, he wants the, the people to go. Um, but in the East, all of those issues, you know, that, that create, you know, some of that uncertainty don't really apply, you know, for the, for the Christians of the East, um, those issues are, are, are really separate. And, and what the, the Christians of the East, especially the Christians of Iraq know, is that he came, he came, he came to Iraq in the middle of all of their suffering war, pandemic, more war, uh, economic collapse, uh, all of the difficulties that they had. And when the Pope first said he would come, I think there were a lot of people who thought, okay, well, he, he'll, they've now announced that he will come, but there will be a reason why he can't, uh, because there are reasons why you couldn't come to Iraq. Um, but that, uh, that that would kind of be the end of it, that, that it wouldn't really happen. I think there were a lot of uh, the Iraqi Christians who believed it wouldn't really happen. And then as it, be as it got closer and these events continued to happen, you know, the pandemic spiked. Uh, there were rocket attacks on the, the airport just two weeks before his, his arrival. And all of these things were, were cascading. And yet Pope Francis said, we're going, we're coming. And you could see there was a real switch in the people here when they realized this man's coming. 
he's coming. He's going to come and be with us. And, and I think that the people here felt that, look, for once, there's a person who says, look, the, the Iraqi Christians themselves and the Iraqis themselves have been living through this. Um, I can come and be with them. So there was a real sense that they had a pope who was willing to be with them, to, 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 to come to them in their experience, in, in the midst of of all of their difficulty and, and, and give them hope, you know, they would come. And, and, and I have to tell you here in Iraq, the Christians love him. They love him. Well, undoubtedly, this has bolstered their fortitude. My question is, after he returned, beyond strengthening their resolve, has it made much of a difference on the ground? And I know that's a hard question. Yeah, it, it, it has um, in, in a couple of ways. You know, the first thing was, as we pointed out in the video, um, between the end of the Iraq war, you know, Iraq continued, uh, and in the visit of Francis, Iraq had continued to drop off the cliff. They had a major period of civil uh, uprising that was virtually uncovered in the West. I mean, those protests went on for months and months and months and, and, and just zero uh, recognition of it in the West. We were all, rep especially in the U.S., we were all wrapped up, up you know, in the election and, and all of these things. But, but Iraq had really fallen off the map. And the visit of Francis brought the, the eyes of the world back to Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, and what's, what's really uh, important about it is for the first time, basically, in memory of, of just about anybody, it was a focus of the eyes of the world on Iraq for a positive reason. And this in turn has had a real impact on the view of the Iraqi Christians uh, by others in Iraq, by the other, uh, other groups uh, in Iraq. Uh, they saw that, you know, that, that this visit of the Pope uh, gave a, uh, a positive view to the world of Iraq that just had not happened before. And I think that's given a lot of people pause. And I know the Archbishop has spoken directly with the leaders in the Iraqi government about it. Uh, and uh, I, I know that the, the Patriarch in, in Baghdad, uh, who was instrumental, uh, central, uh, really, in, in making this visit of the Holy Father happen, that uh, both of them have been able to say to the Iraqi government, to the Kurdish government, look, you know, this is who we are. We are attached to this larger uh, group that can bring uh, all of this positive view uh, towards this country um, if you give us space. You need to give us space. Uh, but And I think at the same time, what it's done is it's shown them, the non-Christians, what they will lose if all the Christians are gone. So, you know, so in, in those respects, I, I think those are, are, are the primary things. Will it convince people who are now in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan to say the Pope came, let's come back. Probably not, maybe, but probably not. But for the people who, who are there, um, it's been a tremendous source of hope and, and, and pride, again, in the dignity of who they are. Well, that takes me directly to the crux of the matter. And it, this is what moved me the most. Um, and I'm going to read it. It's from the postscript to your book. And it's your introductory paragraph where you say, in the genocide years of the ISIS war and its aftermath, two diverging paths remained for the Christians of Iraq. In the first, they would be relegated to a vanishing community on their way to an inevitable end 
their ancient presence dwindling down, dwindling down to that of a caretaker church of a museum people. In the second, they had been honed down to a resilient few, small in number, yet tested and tempered in their faith and character from which a resurrection could begin. So, Steve, what do you think will happen? Will there be an extinction of the Christians in Iraq and the larger Middle East in the next, in our lifetimes, or maybe even in the next decade? So, um, every country in the Middle East is different. So, I'll speak just on, on Iraq right now. Um, prior to the visit of Francis, unquestionably, I think the sentiment was uh, of the first of those two, that really uh, it was hope against hope, but, but people were just holding on and looking to make a, a good show um, on the way out. But, uh, but there was really little hope um, and mostly resignation. Post-Francis, there's a light. There's a light. I, I don't think anybody here um, is, uh, uh, is unrealistic about it. Iraq is an incredibly difficult place. The, the number of Christians left are few. Um, the ability of the Iraqi Christians to do this completely on their own is, is quite difficult. Um, and if they are to survive, they will need the uh, continued solidarity and support of the, the Christian community uh, worldwide. But I, I can say having, having been here through the whole process, both before and after, there's a different light right now. There's a different light right now. There are avenues of hope uh, that remain. When will we know? I, I, it's, uh, it's five years at least before we, we really have, I think, some, some real clarity. Things could break badly here very quickly. Um, you know, there could be uh, another uprising of an ISIS type group. Um, Iraq's a very unstable country uh, right now, and all sorts of things. Uh, could happen, and if there were that type of thing, clearly that would be the uh, that would be the end. Um, but uh, there are signs that things uh, could break the other way. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, the the U.S. Uh, under the Biden administration, at least uh, the beginning here, uh, has shown that they're not um, intending to uh, leave. Uh, their support of the religious minorities uh, in Iraq and, and their support of Iraq as a whole. We understand from directly from the State Department representatives that Iraq may, remains a, a priority country for them, maybe not militarily, um, and it's another discussion, but, but uh, in terms of their support for the country overall. So there's some positive things, you know, in our university, you know, we now have a, a, a great working relationship with a Franciscan University in Steubenville, the University of Dallas, and some other places. Um, these things bring us real hope. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm compelled to mention that at the, uh, the uh, mass uh, in Erbil of Pope Francis, uh, uh, the uh, uh, president of Franciscan University, Father Dave Pivanka, uh, made the trip to Erbil, the first uh, president uh, of an American university to come and, and uh, visit and be with us. And he actually can celebrate it uh, and, and took part in, in that mass. Uh, and speaking with him later, uh, he said he did not think he'd ever been more proud uh, to be a Catholic. Um, and, and Father Dave's a great guy. But, you know, the fact that we would have an American university president willing to come and be with us is, again, a positive, positive sign of hope for us. So those things are coming. And, and I should have said, you know, I, I should have said at the outset in my introduction that you are the vice chancellor of the Catholic University in Erbil. Absolutely. So. Actually, in, in, uh, in this last month, I've been kicked upstairs 
and now I, I, I'm a, a member of the board of trustees. So oh my goodness! I can, yeah, so I, I, I can have uh, more space to to focus on uh, on some of the other work. But right. uh, yeah, yeah. We well, hope can that I some ask? Of you can come and visit us. I uh, I'd like to to ask you now if you would please um, conclude this part of our program. And let us hear uh, Bishop Borda in Aramaic praying the Our Father and giving us a blessing. Sure, he'll come up just now. I hope you have all enjoyed tonight's program and that we have established the beginning of a place of friendship between us all. I will close now in Aramaic with a, a blessing and the Our Father. Burkta de Klitha Yutha Kaddishta, Baba, Bruna, Ruha, Kutcha, Athia, Usharia, and Lochen, Daha, Ukuradana, Walalam, Almin, Amin. Aound was Shmeya, Nefkadash Shmach, Tethe Melku Thach, Nehue Soyanach, Akedna do Shmeya Abbara, Howlan Lahman Sulkan and Yomana. وشوقلن حوبين وحطاهين أي كنا دافحنان شوقلن حياوين ولا تعلان النسيونا إلا بصا من بيشا مطل دي لاخي ملكوثا حي لو تشبحت العالم علمين آمين ستيف words really fail so I will simply say thank you And thank you all again for, for having us here and, and paying attention to us. And please pray for us. Don't forget us. Thank you again. Thank you, Steve. Um, this has been an incredible presentation. Um, you know, we've, we've heard the stories, not nearly as you say, we haven't heard the true, the full story, but you have helped us put a face to, to these refugees and, and it really is. It's heartbreaking to watch it. Um, so, so very heartbreaking, but it was also, um, it was great to hear the, the works of our, of our church that we are, the Catholic church is there and um, working in trying to help all of the people. And I also thank you for sharing your story because um, that um, is so inspirational. And, and uh, I was thinking in the gospel, we've heard so often the story of Jesus telling, you know, the disciples, the apostles to, to leave everything behind and, and follow him. And you are an example of that, um, that truly the Holy Spirit has worked in, is at work in your life and um, really uh, cannot thank you enough for doing this presentation tonight. Um, I know things have been difficult for you there because during COVID, a lot of the you know, support has not been as strong. I would encourage everyone, um, Steve's book is available on Amazon and it's one way we can support them, uh, support Steve in his mission um, at in Iraq. And I'm uh, just holding it up again. Here it is, and it's backwards, so that won't work, sorry. But um, it is um, this by Steve Rasha, The Disappearing People, The Tragic Fate, of the Christians in the Middle East. Um, it does uh, drive home the importance of, of our ministry as Knights and Dames and helping uh, people. So I encourage you to get a copy. Um, just a little bit in closing, before we do close officially, I'd just like to thank again, Nick, for all you did uh, to bring all of this program together for us. And um, it has been truly an amazing evening. I also would like to thank our behind the scenes people, yeah. you know, Sir Lauren Dodd and uh, Dame Sophia Dodd, yeah. who um, there are IT uh, people, gurus and who make our programs run so smoothly. And um, I have to tell you, they do not just come on and do this. They work hours and there have been many rehearsals with Nick and Steve and Lauren to put all of this together. And so I'm just so thankful to them. And um, just a few uh, little um, upcoming events I'm gonna tell you about. Uh, mark your calendar on uh, December 4th, 10 a.m., which is a Saturday. 
we will have an Advent reflection by uh, the new auxiliary bishop of uh, San Diego, uh, Bishop Ro Ramon Bajarano. And so we're really uh, very excited about that program coming together. And we also on January 6th, will be presenting a special reflection by uh, Sir Hugh Barber um, on the Feast of the Epiphany. Um, again, thank you again, Steve, for everything. Uh, this has been tremendous. Uh, we have been blessed already by Bishop Borda, but I would ask that you join me in the memorari as we close and we give thanks for the gifts of all the time and talent of so many that have made this evening uh, possible. And so please, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin, O Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. Our Lady Queen of Palestine, pray, pray for us. Pray for us. Again, thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you. Take care. And God bless everyone. <laughs>